Good afternoon, Rich Nass, Embedded Computer Design, here with some embedded executives. I have Vineet Ganju. He is the Vice President and General Manager of Low Power Audio and AI for Synaptics. That's right. Yeah, hey, Rich. I got that right, right? Perfect. Okay. And David Armour, who is the Head of Wireless Connectivity for Europe. Hello, David. Hi, Rich. Good morning. Good morning. Um, so there's a million different directions we could, we could go with this, but let's just start with um, what are some of the hot things, buzzwords that you're seeing right now in, in, in your respective spaces? Okay, yeah, I'll kick it off. So, I mean, I think one of the newer trends these days, which is not actually new, but it's an evolution of a trend that's been existing for a while, is this idea of ambient sensing, and ambient intelligence sensing. We've heard various uh, topics like uh, smart home or uh, sensing environment. Um, but these days, you know, for IoT, it was always this concept of you have to sense uh, information, process it, and then connect it uh, to something that can take that information. But till today, it's mainly been sensing and connectivity that intelligence on the edge hasn't quite been there, where you can do it in a low power way. So kind of the latest things that you know that we've been seeing in the industry is having that intelligence processing running at very low power together with the sensor. So being able to do the analysis of that data at the sensor, and that way you only have to send the analysis out you know, over the connectivity and not the constant stream of data. So that requires a few things technology-wise, right? First of all, a low power sensors and a low power processor itself that can do that processing. Then you need the intelligence, the algorithms or the AI models to be able to run on that processor in a low power way. And then finally, you need the connectivity, of course, to be able to have long range, low power, um, multiple different connectivity standards to connect to. So what we've been seeing, at, you know, and especially driving at Synaptics is on the low power processors, um, you know, there's been a lot of evolution in terms of going to lower power nodes. Um, chip architectures themselves have been more uh, designed for specific types of processing and purpose-built NPU cores that are built inside the chips themselves. And so there's been a constant evolution of that. But I think the second area, which is the algorithms and the models themselves, is an interesting area because you can imagine with these intelligent sensors, um, there's hundreds or thousands of different applications, which means you need hundreds or thousands of different types of AI models. And this is the constant problem in the industry today is how do you have companies who are not necessarily tech savvy, mm -hmm. medical or industrial or you know, factories and so on, and having them develop AI models specific for their application. So an area where we've seen a lot of progress lately and continue to see is the kind of democratization of developing AI models and allowing non-tech savvy, non-machine you know, machine learning scientists to be able to develop those models. To do the whole set of tools and, and kind of infrastructure around being able to do that. Now, it's not there today where anybody can develop a production-ready AI model. It's not quite that easy. But if they can get 70% of the way or 80% of the way, they can develop mm -hmm. a proof of concept, um, they can show a use case, <clears throat> and then you can bring in the expertise to develop that 100% you know, production-ready model. So that's the that second technical area on the AI processing and AI model development where we've seen a lot of the progress. And then the third part of that is the connectivity. And, and I'll let David talk for a second about the transit connectivity, but you can see that there's a lot of need for longer range, low power, you know, working with different standards. Maybe you can talk about that a little bit. Okay, and I do have about 400 questions okay, sure. for you when David's done. Okay, sure. <laughs> okay. thanks for that. I think in addition to what Vinit said, I mean, the great thing about uh, Synaptics is our vision is to connect everything. So that ties into our investment in Wi-Fi and Bluetooth and other connectivity standards in recent years. And that's really targeting, um, the, IoT is a big casual, right? But where we're focusing is on incredibly low power consumption. So things to do intelligent things at the edge on batteries for significant amounts of time before being recharged or replaced. That really enables a lot of new use cases where mm -hmm. you can sensibly deploy sensors for a long time. And it makes it worthwhile. And it couples in well with these other group of connecting those sensors in a meaningful way. Uh, the other trend we have is that there are many, many standards out there for connecting products, you know, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, um, Zigbee, um, and we've integrated a lot of this together into one of our new chip families, which has a single solution for Wi-Fi, 
and it's all related standards, including six gigahertz, uh, related to Bluetooth and the audio, uh, Thread, Matter, and Zigbee. So we can really pull together all these sensors and, and make meaningful sense of it. Okay, you both mentioned low power a lot. Let's quantify that. What are we talking about when we talk about low power? Yeah, I can give you an example, maybe not in terms of milliwatts, but in terms of the use case. So what we're targeting is to be able to, for example, do a sensor that you can uh, apply on your window, you know, just kind of a lip and stick, put a sensor on a window that's always listening for a glass break event. So it's the sensor is a microphone. It's listening for an audio event of a glass breaking. The target is for that sensor to operate you know, in a, that always listening mode for 10 years without having to change the battery. So that's the kind of power level. So you're talking about micro amps. Right. Micro, I mean, the use case, if you think about it, it's, it's in a low power mode where it's, there's not a glass break event for a long period of time. Mm -hmm. And then there's a few times when some audio will happen and you have to do some sensing and analysis and then go back into the low power mode. So in the low power mode, yeah, you're talking about micro amps. Like and then what is the action that it takes? Because it takes more than micro amps to signal some larger system. Right. So the action that it takes is it, it, it uh, records the audio, you know, through the microphone sensor. It actually does uh, AI processing on it to de determine if it's actually a glass breaking sound versus something else that may sound something similar. And then sending the analysis out, right? Telling the sensor hop in the home or the security company or the police department that a glass break event did happen. So there's a short burst of connectivity as well. Okay. And now you're interacting with the larger connectivity system. Right, now you're act yeah, interacting with the larger connectivity system in your home. And then as David was saying, that could be over multiple standards, ULE or Bluetooth or Wi-Fi or Zigbee or Okay, is it important, back to you, David, is, is it important to choose which medium you, you want to be transmitting over or do we need to be in this multi-mode state at all times? Well, that's quite a difficult one to answer. It really comes down to what the application is. Um, and how much data the sensors or devices need to send. Uh, for example, if there's a lot of data, then Wi-Fi is very efficient for that. Mm -hmm. and you can send the data and get back into the sleep modes and, and protect the battery. Um, if it's local data, then maybe Bluetooth, where a lot of devices will talk maybe to your cell phone, mm -hmm. and send that data to your app and then back into, into sleep modes. We also have other sensors where we're using our, our dead ULE, which would last very, very long periods of time and connect over long distances. But albeit small amounts of data, so it's really a, a choosing which of these it would be um, at the at the sensor node, um, and then in the hubs where it comes integrated together, that's where the multi-radio support uh, comes in. Okay, what's the real hard part about doing this from your customer's perspective? I think the uh, there's a number of aspects there. Um, I think if you look at a hub or, or a device, having I mean, trying to fit multiple radios, for example with a battery, with the antennas and everything else you need into a very small physical space. Um, and what we're finding is that you know, to look at some of our recent successes in uh, wearables, you know, the space is small, um, so these are small chip, these are uh, integrated components, maybe sharing antennas, which can do very well with those mm -hmm. radios. And that helps that industrial design really fantastic. Okay, same question to you. What's the real hard part? What's the part that the engineers are struggling with? Yeah, as I alluded to earlier, I think the hard part from the processing point of view is the is getting that uh, AI algorithm to be able to sense uh, to analyze that sensor data in a robust enough way that it can be deployed in you know any home, any hospital. I mean, if you think of the use cases, like for example, if we use the microphone as a sensor, we could sit here for a couple of minutes and probably come up with a thousand things you want to sense from an audio point of view. You know, for example, I talked about glass break detection. Mm -hmm. Um, it also, in the home, you can detect whether the fire alarm is going off um, in a medical setting. You know, these days there's a lot of um, trends around uh, aging in place, aging at home. And you want to have that same monitoring capability to detect whether somebody's fallen down or even, you know, something that sounds as trivial as um, being able to detect how often the toilet is flushing, you know, how often that person is going to the bathroom. So in some cases, the accuracy of that model is extremely important. Um, for example, glass breakage, you don't want to send the police out you know, every time there's a false alarm. So being able to robustly tell when that glass broke but not have a, a bunch of false alarms is difficult. I mean, I think AI is kind of you know, a buzzword that you know, people use a lot and, and people think that it's everywhere today. But to get those AI models working you know, in a production you know, 
ready environment is extremely difficult to make. And that's why we're working with you know companies like Edge and Pulse to produce tools that allow companies to develop it faster, get further mm -hmm. along um, with that development, so that they can prove up concepts before they put in the effort of making it production ready. Okay. One more for you, David, before we close. You mentioned a couple of times shared antenna, and that's not a throwaway. That's really, really hard to do, and, and you're making it uh, sound pretty easy. <laughs> no, it's, it's certainly not very easy. Um, I mean, a lot of the solutions we have in our portfolio, we have Wi-Fi and Bluetooth together, mm -hmm. and that's a really interesting use case. Um, for example, in, say, a, a wearable, you may use Bluetooth to connect small amounts of data to update your phone, mm -hmm. um, or, and then Wi-Fi to do bigger sharing. Right. And same solution in, in, in the phones, but in there, the space is really tight. So having two separate radios with two separate sets of antennas close together, they will interfere. Mm -hmm. so they're generally in the same frequency band. Right. So over the years, it's been developed to have a single chip solution. And that requires us to have some real intelligence about what the radios are trying, what the application is trying to do. Um, you know, is it trying to send a certain type of uh, data? Is it video or voice? So we have to be careful about latency. Or is it just data where we can slot in mm -hmm. and somewhere? And if we can do this in this really uh, intelligent way, we have the ability to control who transmits and sends at any one time in a very precise way. Uh, so that enables us to share the antenna. If you don't get it right, then you know, you're going to be losing packets, it's going to be home. Uh, but through our solutions, there's a lot of generations of products now. Uh, most of the smartphones and other devices there are using this kind of combo chip with small antennas, shared antennas. Okay. Thank you, David. Thank you, Vinit. Thanks, Rich.